Hello, folks, and welcome to Sensory Friendly Saturdays. My name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Ontario Science Centre. Today, I am joined by Danielle and Christina from the Geneva Centre for Autism for our workshop all about mindful movement. If you require live subtitles for today's event, you can access those by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. While our audience may be watching from different politically defined regions, we acknowledge that we are all participating in this event on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples since the beginning. All three of us are speaking to you today from the city of Toronto on Turtle Island. We acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credits, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. To learn more about the land you live on and the Indigenous peoples who also live here, I encourage you to visit Whose Land Online. Educating yourself about whose land you live on is only step one of the process to learn more. So I encourage everyone to take time to learn more and reach out to family and friends to do the same. Together, we can support the vibrant Indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial and learn how to respect the land we now call home. If this is your first time at a Sensory Friendly Saturday event, a warm welcome to you. For the last few years, the Ontario Science Centre and the Geneva Centre for Autism have partnered to bring you hands-on workshops, presentations, and discussions for all ages and abilities. Sensory Friendly Saturdays occur at the beginning of every month with new topics to learn about. If this is not your first time at the event, welcome back. It's so great to have you here with us again. Throughout today's presentation, you are more than welcome to and encouraged to ask questions. The Q&A box can be found at the bottom of your screen and you have the option to ask your questions anonymously if you wish. After the presentation, we'll take some time to answer those questions from you all. As well, any links shared today during the presentation will be included in the chat and sent in a follow-up email within the next few days, so don't worry if you're not able to copy all the information shared. Now, before I throw it over to Danielle and Christina to introduce themselves, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. A poll is about to pop up on your screen that will ask you who you are, just so we can have a better idea of who's in our audience today. So please take about 30 seconds to select the option that most relates to you and submit. And don't worry, the polls are anonymous. So who's here today? Are you a parent caregiver, an individual with autism spectrum disorder, an educator, or do you identify as other? So we'll give you about 10 more seconds to submit your answer in the poll. All right, so here are the results of the poll. Looks like we have majority parent slash caregiver today uh, and individuals with autism spectrum disorder and a couple other. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Now we do have one more poll to share before we begin the presentation. In this poll, we'd like to know how you'd rate your knowledge of autism spectrum disorder. So please take about 30 seconds again to select the option that you most relate to in this poll. And again, all answers are anonymous. So how'd you rate your knowledge? Are you very knowledgeable? somewhat knowledgeable? Do you have limited knowledge of autism spectrum disorder? Or do you have no knowledge and you are eager to learn during today's webinar? We'll give you about seven more seconds to answer that. And there we go. All right, so a little little bit of everything here, but that's okay. We're all here to learn, especially me. I'm very excited for today. All right, so thank you everyone for participating in those polls. There will be a few more that pop up throughout the presentation, so stay tuned for those. 
And without further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Danielle and Christina to introduce themselves and begin today's presentation about mindful movement. Okay, good morning, everyone. So my name is Danielle Gonzalez. Thank you so much for joining us today. I work at Geneva Center for Autism as an instructor therapist, and I've been with Geneva Center for the last seven years in both the IBI program and the respite program. I also work part-time as a yoga teacher, and I primarily teach young teenagers and adults. I have been teaching for the last year and a half. I have always loved being active since I was a young kid. I grew up going to camp ever since I was just six years old and spent lots of time doing outdoor activities. This experience taught me the value of how amazing movement is within our days. There are so many wonderful accessible ways to move our bodies out there. I'm very excited to talk to you all about them today. Hi, my name is Christina Medeiros and I'm a clinical supervisor with Geneva Center for Autism. I've been with the agency for eight years and in the field of autism services for 18 years. In terms of my interest and background with movement and exercise, it's mostly just a personal interest from a history of being active and uh, competitive in sports. And I created a foundation called Pedabelts for Autism some time ago that I've since retired, but it was a great format for me to incorporate my interest in training and use of kettlebells specifically and supporting the autism community. Um, and I'm happy to share what I know and what I've researched here with you today. Okay, so welcome to our presentation about the benefits of daily movement. This presentation today is going to focus on discussing how movement can be accessible and friendly for all ages and bodies. We are going to first discuss yoga, what it is, the benefits, and how it can be included in a young children's daily schedule. We are then going to focus on movement as a whole. We will discuss how to make movement fun and interactive for children and their families. Okay, so before we get into yoga specifically, we wanted to discuss the evidence-based research on the benefits of movement. Here are some of the few examples that stood out to us. So firstly, movement has been shown to benefit emotional well-being in children, teenagers, and adults. Due to this, it can also reduce stress levels when it is included in daily routines, as well as impact one's mental health functioning on a daily basis. Savina and colleagues in 2016 studied how it can impact young youth self-esteem when movement such as dancing, sports, and exercise is included in educational settings. The study also explored how movement can increase energy and motivation and can overall help with academic performance. Okay, so getting into the yoga, let's discuss what it is and the benefits it has to offer. So yoga can be traced to Northern India over 5,000 years ago. Yoga is traditionally seen as a Hindu spiritual practice that focuses on breathing, meditation, and the asanas. So asanas is just a word that means the specific body postures and movements. The great thing about yoga is that it is accessible and everybody is able to do it. The main focus of yoga is to calm the mind, reduce stress, strengthen the body overall, and increase flexibility. Okay, so looking at some of the few benefits of yoga, um, some of these ones stood out to me. So cardiovascular benefits is one of them, as I mentioned, reducing stress, which is also always positive, increasing strength, improving our posture, building flexibility, enhancing mental and emotional states, enriching sleep, and overall improving lifestyle choices. Okay, so you might be thinking to yourself right now, how can yoga be incorporated in a daily schedule for kiddos? So I'm going to go through some examples now, starting first with visual schedules. So a visual schedule is an example of how movement, such as yoga, can be included in a child's day. The schedule can list out activities that are going to be done in the order that you can customize as a parent or caregiver or an educator. So for example, you can customize it to be first breakfast, then story time, followed by some yoga, and then some free play. A visual schedule can encourage independence and it really just brings structure overall to one's day. Okay, so another example is a first sunboard. So this is also a great visual tool that can be used to show what the expectation of the activity is and what will take place afterwards. So this example on the slide says first yoga, then bike time, for example. 
If movement is non-preferred for a child at first, the first send board item can be really helpful because it allows them to see what can happen next. And it can teach them the value of doing something maybe that is new, maybe a little intimidating at the beginning, followed by something they truly, really enjoy. Okay, looking at some breathing visuals now. So as I mentioned, a big part of yoga is the breathing practice that is included in it. And for kids and even adults, this can be quite complex sometimes to understand and to practice. It is quite hard. So visuals can be a really great help for both kids, teenagers, and even adults. So here are some examples on the slide. So the first one, the one where you see the flower and the candle, that one's just explaining how to take a really nice, deep, mindful breath. So for a kiddo, you can explain that they're smelling a flower when they breathe in and then blowing out a candle, you can even reference like a birthday cake when they take that exhale, big breath out. The other two examples you see are just the amount of breaths that you can prompt a kiddo to do when they're feeling a little bit stressed or when you wanna start your yoga practice with them. So there's numbers one to five, for example, on both of them in different orders. They can touch them with their fingers. You can also put Velcro on these and they can match them into the squares to, just to show them we're gonna take five deep breaths. Some other examples that I really like using are the square breathing and the rainbow breath. So the square breathing, just a very simple visual, has a nice little fish there and it just shows how someone can trace with their finger, big breaths up, then down, then up, then down. So this is something that you can print out, you can have in your purse, um, it can be up in a school, it can really be utilized in whichever environment um, a kiddo needs it in. And then the rainbow breath, see, these are uh, some of my personal favorite ones from doing a lot of remote sessions in the last year. Um, rainbow breath, we can all do it together today, this morning, if you'd like to try it out. We all start by placing our hands together at our heart. And you're gonna take a big breath in, raise your arms to the sky. And then as you exhale, you're going to create the rainbow. So hands come down, big exhale. So this one's really fun for kids and nice and easy to practice. Let's try it one more time together. So arms go up, big breath in and big exhale. Good, nice job. Okay, so these next slides are some examples of how you can teach kids different yoga poses names with a matching visual beside it. So at Geneva Center, we make a lot of these visual examples, and then we place them in a binder, for example, so that kiddos can flip through them during the yoga time that we prepare for them after lunch periods or even in their free play. So these are some more examples here. Um, these visuals are really just a great way to introduce yoga to kids in a fun way, which can help promote independence in the future by allowing them to sort through the visual visuals on their own. Again, these are really handy things to pack. You can put them in a car, in a backpack, wherever you're going, um, in the different environments that the kid goes to. Okay, so some other great resources I want to share today were um, everything that's online really, focusing mainly on YouTube. So the first one I want to touch on is one that is presented by Geneva Center for Autism. It's our Warrior Wednesdays um, featuring myself and Christina. We have some different yoga moves in there and some different um, fitness videos as well. They range from around five minutes um, to 20 minutes. There are some for kiddos and there's some specifically for adults as well. So it's a free um, YouTube channel that you can access and look at those different movement examples. Another one for um, kiddos that is really fun that I like to use is Cosmic Kids. So the lady you see on the slide here in all blue, she is a yoga teacher and she has thousands of really wonderful videos that are kid friendly. She has a whole story behind them, usually a really fun background as well. So those are really great. Um, if again, a laptop and iPad um, is something that's accessible for you and your family, it's always fun um, to do that together. Okay, so before we conclude on the yoga portion of our presentation today, I wanted to discuss how yoga can be very accessible for adults and caregivers as well. So it's important to dedicate time to yourself even when life gets busy. Self-care does look different, but when making the time for it, um, it's, it's important that you choose something you love and something that feels good for you and your body. So I want to show some basic yoga poses that you can try at home on your lunch break or whenever it really fits into your daily schedule. So if you'd like to this morning, feel, feel free to push the laptop a little bit further, get comfortable, get some space to try out these next couple of poses. Okay, so starting first with our low lunge pose. So this pose helps stretch and release tension in our hips. It also does a really great job at stretching the lower body overall. 
It's very accessible. The arms can be up, they can be down. You can even lift the back knee if that is more desirable to get a little bit deeper into the posture. So if you're trying this out right now at home, how we're gonna get into it is you're gonna step your right foot forward bend the right knee and then keep the left uh, leg straight behind you, untuck the back toes. And then again, it's your choice. You can put your arms up or you can put your arms down. And then I want you to slowly start to bend in towards that right knee coming forward, just like the pictures are showing here. So again, you can take it pretty easy today, not bend super far. If you're feeling very open, you can go a little bit further. With these types of postures, it's always remember to go slow and listen to your body. And you can also do it on each side of your body. So starting with the right side and then you can change it up and then go towards the left side. Hope that's feeling good. If you're practicing that one at home today, that's our low lunge. It's a great one to do on a daily basis. Okay, and then we have another one. This is one of my personal favorites. It's called a seated side bend. So these ones are really great for back pain and also just opening up the side lower body. So you can try this one out by starting um, sitting on the ground or even on a chair, if that's where you're seated, even a couch, it also definitely works. Um, your legs can be crossed if that's comfortable for your hips. If it's not comfortable, you can also just place your knee side by side, the legs don't have to necessarily be crossed. So what you wanna do is you wanna send your right arm up towards the sky and then you're gonna slowly start to bend over towards the left side. Your left palm can be down on the ground, on the floor, can be hovering. If you're sitting in a chair like I am, it can be on the couch, whatever is feeling good for your body. You wanna feel that extension in the right side. Good, and as you exhale, let's do the other side. So inhale, left arm goes up and let's move it over. Finding that side bend. Again, finding a comfortable spot for that right hand, whatever works for you in your home environment today and release, good. Awesome. Okay, another one here I want to share was butterfly pose. So this one is a really great hip opener. So for this one, if you're trying it out with us today, you can start by sitting with your legs straight out in front of you, um, raising your pelvis, even some, on something like a blanket, um, a block, a pillow. And then when you start to feel some opening in your hip, that's where I want you to stay. You never want any type of pain or pressure in these poses, just a really nice stretch. You can start to lean forward like the lady in the white is if you want a little bit of a deeper variation in this posture, or you can always sit up with a nice straight spine like the man is in the photo. I'm just showing here how, again, this butterfly pose can look different for every body, but overall it can be really beneficial no matter what it looks like here. Okay, so moving on to some chair yoga poses. So this is a, just a really great example about how yoga is really accessible um, and can be done really in any environment. So this can be done um, in an office space, can be done at home, wherever you are um, today. So the first example, if you'd like to try it out today, we're gonna keep our left foot grounded on the floor and we're gonna take that right ankle and we're gonna place it on the left thigh to begin. Hands can go onto that right leg here and you can slowly start to bend forward. The aim here is to feel a stretch in your right hip and in also in your right glute. If you feel a little bit something there, that's also okay. If it's too much, you can back off. Staying wherever you want today, whatever feels good for your body. Great, and let's place that right foot down and let's quickly do the other side. So this time right foot stays grounded, left ankle is coming up and it's gonna be placed on that right thigh Stay here if that feels good. Or again, if you want the options there, you can start to lean forward to feel a little bit more um, intense for that hip. Perfect. Okay, so that's a good one to keep in mind if you're doing a lot of um, sitting these days. Another one for the um, posture for the back is the seated cat cow. So hands are gonna go on towards your knees for this one. Stay seated wherever you are today. As you inhale, look up towards the sky. So big breath in, and then as you exhale, slowly start to round your spine, look down towards the thighs, the ground. You can close your eyes if you want. Good, let's do that one more time. Inhale to look up, squeezing your shoulder blades together, and exhale, start to round the spine and look down. Perfect. Great job, everyone. Okay, and the last one I want to show is just a nice neck um, opener, ne nice neck stretch that you can do in a seated position. So for today, wherever you're seated, your hands can be wherever you want. They can be down on your legs or they can just also be dangling. Let's take our right ear to our right shoulder. You can close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you this morning. You wanna to start to feel a stretch in the left side of your neck. You can start to also turn your chin down towards 
your neck here to get a little bit deeper into the back muscles as well. Make sure this is nice and comfortable for you. Slowly start to release, coming back through center. And let's do the other side now. So this time our left ear is coming down to our left shoulder. Take your time to get there, no rush. Feeling the stretch this time in the right side of our neck. Stay here if that's feeling good. If you wanna explore getting into the back muscles as well, again, chin is going to go down towards the thighs. Perfect, slowly release. Very nice. Okay, I have three more chair yoga poses for you today. The first one I'm not gonna demonstrate just because of um, the way I'm sitting, but just wanted to show you if you wanna try it, it's a really fun one. It's called Warrior One, but it's the seated variation. So the chair is acting as a support there for the thigh. So if you'd like to try this at home, feel free. Your arms can be up, connected the palms, or they can be down towards the sides, really whatever is feeling good. They can even be on your hips. The second one we have today is for the shoulders and for the upper body. So we can do this one. We can all inhale our arms up towards the sky. Good, and then exhale, slowly bring it down. Nice and simple, good. One more time, inhale, arms up, and exhale, arms down. Good, awesome job. Last one here, similar to the other one, is just showing the neck movement. So she's going right to the left, then looking up and then down. So if you'd like to also try that this morning, feel free. Nice and gently, nice and slow. Good. Awesome. Okay. So the last couple of slides I want to share with everyone today was some car yoga moves. So maybe you've tried it before, maybe not. Um, something maybe to try later today if you're running some errands, um, but a great place to find movement if you are going for longer drives, you're stuck in traffic, whatever the situation is, is in the car actually. So something you can try in the car is connecting your hands to opposite elbows, opening up. You can stay just like this, depending on the space, depending on how it feels. And you can also move side to side. Kind of looks like a fun dance move. So feel free to try that one out today. Nice, let's slowly release. And then our last focus here is going to be on our wrists. So right hand's gonna come forward and we're going to take our left fingers and we're gonna grab onto those right fingers, allowing our wrists to stretch out here. Nice job and slowly release, feel free to Roll it out, shake it out, get ready for the other side. Left hand forward this time, right fingers, grabbing on. Nice, big stretch for the wrist. Beautiful, slowly release. Good work. And again, the neck one is there just to show the different variations. I know we've touched on those already today. Just one last example there. Okay, so this is my last slide about the car yoga moves. So just again, some other variations here. The first one that we can try is we can take our right hand and we can place it across our body. Like you're about to give yourself a little hug here. And then your left hand can scoop up, grab on to that right elbow. You can slowly start to stretch. Good, slowly start to release. And let's try the other side. This time left arms going across. Right arm's gonna scoop up the left arm. Good. And as you exhale, slowly release. And let's try the vacation arms is what I like to call them. That's not the formal name, which is a fun one. So hands are gonna come behind your head here and you can slowly start to open up your chest, squeezing your shoulder blades together. You can look up if you want, or you can stay neutral, whatever is feeling good for you today. Good, perfect, slowly release. And last car yoga move here, hands are coming together, clasp those fingers and just push everything forward. Good, and exhale to release. Thanks so much guys. I hope that felt good at home um, in your bodies today. Hope everyone enjoyed the yoga portion of the presentation. I'm going to now pass it off to Christina to go into movement as a whole. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'll get my slides ready here. Sorry, this is exactly what I was, oh, here we go. Now I remember. Okay, so I'm gonna expand on what Danielle's um, demonstrated today. So we know that yoga is, um, as Danielle said, for every body. So um, 
regardless of your age, your um, physical abilities, um, whatever, you know, wherever you're coming, you're starting from, there are yoga moves that can be modified and suited for um, various levels. And I want to add more to what Danielle has said about um, the benefits of movement and activity. So specifically, I'm going to discuss the benefits associated with regular physical activity for youth. So there's research to show that um, regular phys physical activity can lead to improved health-related uh, physical fitness, improved bone health, and decreased body fat and reduced depressive symptomology. So I have a poll for everyone this morning. I'd like to hear from you what you believe to be the recommended amount of physical activity for children and adolescents per day. Is it 30 minutes per day, 60 minutes per day, 90 minutes per day, or more than 90 minutes per day? Give you another five seconds to respond. Okay, can we see the results? Most believe 30 minutes a day and some 60 minutes a day. Okay, so the, um, I'm losing my spot here. Sorry, folks, get bear with me. Okay, so the answer is the recommended number of uh, minutes per day is 60 minutes for adolescents and children. So that's ages six to 17 years old. And that's moderate to, uh, moderate to vigorous uh, intensity here. So we know that. So the recommendation is 60 minutes per day. And next we're gonna talk about how active are youth with ASD compared to typically developing peers. So research shows that youth with ASD do not achieve the minimum recommendation and are less physically active than typically developing youth. It also indicates that there's a further decline in physical activity among children and youth with ASD as they age. So these factors contribute to poor health related fitness and high rates of overweight and obesity for youth with ASD. And what are the barriers to this? So we know that physical activity is really important for your health. We know the recommended number of minutes and that um, individuals with ASD are really falling short of reaching those, um, act, those activity levels. So what are the barriers? Why is this happening? At the individual level, there's research to indicate that movement difficulties affect 50% of individuals with autism. Poor motor set, uh, skills rather affect coordination and balance. Social communication impairments limit the engagement in sports groups and the forming of peer relationships. Sensory modulation problems may lead to avoidance of intense sensory stimulation and a preference for sedentary activities. So overall, I'm speaking of screen time here. And I would say that's possibly due to just a likely, um, a history of um, a lot of access to screen time and not becoming a preference over more vigorous activity and then contributing to more sedentary um, lifestyle. And what are the barriers to participating in physical activities for youth with ASD? So beyond the individual level, there are systemic and community um, challenges. There's a lack of appropriate programs for this population. There are barriers to inclusion in school and community um, programs. There's even a lack of research and assessment tools in terms of how to accommodate, accommodate social communication, motor and behavioral impairments for individuals with ASD, and even a lack of exercise partners. So what we need are creative strategies to increase the success and enjoyment of physical activity for individuals with ASD. So we're gonna address, or we'll talk about some barriers here and how to address them. The development and offering appropriate programs for this population is definitely needed. In terms of school and community programs, there needs to be a range of activities and supports. We want to target reducing and eliminating policy, attitudinal and behavior, or sorry, physical barriers. We wanna work with families and organizations supporting individuals with disabilities, staff training is needed and honoring individual differences. And I'll add too that I just feel there's a, a lack of prioritizing movement for individuals with autism. When you think of current interventions or even school supports, the focus is uh, generally on social communication, academic impairments, but physical activity is left out. And given we know there are barriers here at the individual level, I think it's worth including physical activity as even an IEP goal or just a general goal for a person in, as part of a treatment plan. So we're gonna hone in on a few of these barriers and look at what can be done on a smaller scale at home and in the community, in the classroom even. So although the recommendation is 60 minutes a day, you may find that 60 minutes 
is just a needs to be a long term goal. It's not achievable right now. We have to build up to that. So in addition to thinking of it as a long term goal of 60 minutes, you can also look at small gains to make within the day. So where can um, shorter periods of activity be incorporated in the day to make this easier to maintain over one's lifetime. We want physical activity to be enjoyable so that's important. So it's important to be patient and again build up toward that long term goal. So what I have here are um, some tips. So generally we want to start small. Um, and I have some here, some uh, pictures here I'll get to, but first let's go to a poll. And I'd like to hear from you, what are some small activities you can include in your day? Or sorry, it's more of a question in the chat. Um, so small activities you can include in your day or that you already do, that you're just a way that you're intentionally targeting adding movement to your day and um, or where can you do that if you haven't already? So I'll look out for your answers in the chat. which I've just noticed I can't actually see in this presentation mode. No worries. Uh, if anything comes <laughs> through, I can, uh, I can mention those for okay, you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> while, while those are coming in, and I, I encourage you to uh, let us know, this might though prompt you to think of some things. So starting small. So again, looking at aiming for 60 minutes a day, but it's perfectly fine to do shorter periods throughout the day. Some ways to do that would be, to um, choose to walk to a destination rather than drive. So let's say it's, um, you know, school is within a reasonable walking distance. Maybe it's the choice to walk to school, but be picked up to go home. Um, another option is to another way to include movement is including it in your uh, already existing schedule. For example, if it's walking the dog, can uh, your child be included in that? Um, when I think of a great tip that a colleague shared with me that she works on with her clients is a preferred place. So if going to the dollar store is a really enjoyable place, maybe a way to sneak in some extra movement is to park further away so that you have to walk the distance there. And then you have the benefit if you've bought some things to carry some things back. So you're adding some weight to the, to the movement as well. And overall, um, in terms of start, starting small rather, I really encourage you to involve more people, involving the whole family. So you have more models, more people to support um, getting uh, active and more opportunities to do, to do different things together. Okay, and next, um, build motor skills. So you may need to build some fundamental motor skills in order to participate in physical activities and sports. And to make this enjoyable, um, I encourage you to, um, for your child to move in different ways and to incorporate into uh, different equipment. So moving in different ways would be uh, hopping, running, jumping, skipping, walking backward even. I think of, you know, if you've been, as many of us have been in uh, lockdown for several months at a time, then you're often just walking back and forth. And a way to just change it up is, you know, with your child, it can be, let's make a fun movement out of walking backward together. And that could help with also motor planning and coordination, walking with one foot sidestepping um, side to side across a space or shuffling side to side. So different ways to incorporate different movement and different types of equipment, broadening the person's repertoire of equipment they're used to, they've used and they've had experience with. So doing these things at home can increase the likelihood that the individual will enjoy other socially engaging physical activities, such as playground games and recreational sports. Another tip is to sample different activities. So there's a wide range of physical activities that can be beneficial and worth trying. Um, I encourage you to sample a number of them that fall into these categories of fitness, social interactions, and independence. So with fitness, activities that involve moderate to vigorous activity and get the heart rate, uh, heart rate up and your breathing up. The example I have here is a um, stationary bike. I think that's a great tool if you have access to one. Um, even if you have a regular bike, it can buy, though I forget what they're called, but you just attach it to your regular bike so it can be used indoors. And so a person who has... Um, coordination issues or balance issues, you know, jogging might be too much of a reach right now, but a stationary bike is a great activity to make use of. For social interactions, thinking of activities that one can do with another person. Um, so playing a game of catch or tennis. And um, for independence, things as Danielle mentioned, like yoga or um, a home fitness um, activity. And for those, there's great um, 
apps and videos out there, again, as Danielle mentioned, that you can make use of that are free and accessible and you can do in your own home. And I'll add that with any of these, you may need to scale them back. So when I think of, you know, when I said playing catch, if that seemed like there's no way I can teach the individual I'm uh, supporting with autism to play catch, they, they can't do that right now, scale it back. So we're just looking at maybe being holding a ball and passing it to a person one foot away and then increasing to three feet away and adding the toss then. Underhand and overhand, they feel very different. So practicing both of those and just moving gradually further away as a person becomes more comfortable and confident is able to complete that movement independently. Um, did I? Okay. And then next slide. So as a parent, you can be an important role model for an active lifestyle. So in addition to um, being a role model yourself, I encourage you to consider how many other people are in this individual's life who can also act as role models and can encourage the individual to be active. So maybe it's going to be um, the phys ed teacher, um, you know, babysitters, aunts, uncles, cousins, who else can be involved to help create an active lifestyle throughout this person's day and week. Um, so I have here, you know, parent being a role model, community programs to reach out to, and IEP goals. In terms of community programs, I think there can be some hesitancy to reach out to community programs that don't explicitly advertise that they support individuals with autism. So it might be worth just, you know, calling them and sharing what you know about motivating your child. And maybe there's an individual who works there who would be happy to take this on and want to be coached by you on how to support your child in a community program. For IEP goals, as I mentioned earlier, that's often neglected. Physical activity is often neglected as a goal. And given how important it is to a person's health and lifestyle, um, it's worth exploring this as an IEP goal. So it's on paper and something that's going to be tracked throughout one's um, educational experience. So a poll here is what are some simple, easily accessible activities you can include in your day right away? And you can um, check off any of these. We'll give you five seconds to respond. Yeah, so practice walking different directions easily. You can do that at home right now. If you could tilt your computer and do some where, you're, where you are. Stretching, Danielle showed some great ones you can do at a desk or you know just sitting, bouncing a ball, and there's many more. Okay, and next. So Danielle mentioned these, sorry, everyone, um, visual schedules and routines. This is a great way to structure the use of um, activities in one's day. So first then board, and I pulled that from an obstacle course, um, the use of first then for an obstacle course. So the individual has the um, target of bouncing a ball 20 times, shaking some sensory bottles, and then jumping in on a trampoline. So that lets the individual know a clear start and end to each activity, and then they're done for the day. So including that, you know, that could be included three times a day, maybe every other hour, there's different activities to do. Scheduling and routine, again, as Danielle mentioned, so having movement incorporated into one's day and making use of preferences. So as I mentioned, screen time, you know, video games, YouTube, those are high preferences. So within that medium, um, you can find free videos and apps that include um, fitness and movement directed to kids and adults. So making use of those preferences to um, help support increasing activity in one's day. And these are just some general guidelines. So this is a lengthy list and I'll leave this up here if you wanna take a screenshot. I'm also gonna share my um, email address at the end. If you wanted these resources, I'm happy to share them with you. They're general guidelines and it's important um, in addition to these to tailor the exercise program or movement to a person's individual needs and preferences to maintain interest over a long period. But these are divided into three categories of environment, exercise considerations and instruction feedback and reinforcement. So we want in the environment to, to be predictable and familiar to the individual. Visual cues, as I mentioned, help with knowing where to stand, um, even how many things to complete, where to go next. Avoiding distractions such as loud noises and bright lights. Use of visual schedules also as mentioned to provide structure and aid in anticipating transitions. For the exercise considerations, the use of adapted equipment to accommodate motor impairments. I mentioned a stationary bike as an option. There was a picture there of a trampoline that had handles. That's a great way to adapt equipment to make it safer. 
and individual sessions. So when you think of a gymnasium in a school or you know a rec center, just the the sound when you walk in, the fans, and then you add balls bouncing. There's a lot of noise. So initially, individual sessions might be needed to even get the person used to the environment or used to the exercise before you start adding more people. And I can't suggest this enough about progress being gradual, not shooting for 60 minutes or I'm not doing it at all. It might have to be two minutes, five minutes, working up to 20, three times a day before you can get to 60 um, consecutive minutes. And providing sufficient breaks. Again, if someone historically is very sedentary, um, breaks are going to be needed to keep the effort initially low and build up to more effortful experience and um, tolerating that. So giving lots of breaks initially. Sufficient warm up and cool down, and that's important to avoid injuries. Being aware of negative behavior and working with caregivers professionals in the best way to address these. Providing a variety of activities and choices. So we talked about that and with the questions as well. There's a lot of activities out there, everything from horseback riding, bike riding, swimming, dance classes, and then just, you know, fitness um, with, you know, barbells and dumbbells and exercise bands. So there's a lot that you can do. So having a variety of activities to choose from and trying different things, the more likely you are to land on something the person is uh, more keen to do or enjoy, will enjoy. Instruction feedback and reinforcement. So you want to keep the instructions brief. Avoid lengthy sentences and explanations. Modeling is also a great way to keep instructions brief by just showing it. Combining uh, verbal instructions with visuals is important. Manual guidance during motor activities. So if, like I mentioned with catch, if that's just really um, difficult right now, a hand over hand support and passing the ball at a close distance might be needed before you can gradually increase the distance and remove yourself as um, the support person. Involving peer mentors, typically developing would be great. You have more models and to encourage acts, um, encourage people who are acting as role model, models rather, so that if you're supporting, you can prompt the physical movements. And providing a lot of praise and high fives throughout. This is a challenging, you know, effortful activity. Um, you might need to support a lot with just encouragement throughout providing breaks with access to favorite things and competing sensory activities and offering stickers, small toys, healthy edibles to support adherence to instructions. So we've covered, you know, various ways to uh, modify exercises and offer a lot of exercises, visuals or a lot of choices rather. Um, and I want to now challenge you to be creative. So a great activity I like to incorporate um, with my lessons are obstacle courses. So if you want an obstacle, obstacle course to include kicking an object, crawling through, over, under, or through something, weaving around an object, jumping on or over something, throw, uh, throwing items through or in something, and step from one object to another. So thinking about what you have access to in your home, in your backyard, in your community, maybe a local park, what you have in your garage, what do you have around and how can you make use of it? You can answer this in the chat and share some ideas in terms of how to build an obstacle course in your home. So feel free to include those in the chat. And I want to add, um, while you're hopefully brainstorming some of these, oh great, we have a poll, thank you, Rachel. Um, so what do you have around your home, backyard, local park that can be included in an obstacle course? Pillows and blankets to make a fort, use of cardboard boxes to make a curved path, exercise ball to bounce on, outdoor playground to climb, and other. So what do you have around? And, the, you know, I hopefully have most of these. And if not, there's plenty of other things out there that you can make use of. And if you are really stumped for ideas, but this is something you want to do, I can't stress enough a quick Google search of obstacle course for children or obstacle course for adults. And you'll find a slew of, um, great, a slew of uh, ideas and uh, creative, you know, things you can throw together without having to buy stuff that's gonna take up a lot of space, just using what you have around your house. And oops, I have this up here one more time in case you wanna take a screenshot, but I know we wanna have a nice question and answer period. So I'll go on to my thank you. And I have my email address there. If you are interested in any of the resources I shared, I cited everything, but I'm happy to share with you the resource list and links to all of those journal articles and websites. And that's all I have for my portion of the presentation. 
Well, perfect. Thank you both to you, Danielle and Christina, for the wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, I was following along with the yoga poses that you were doing, Danielle, and my body feels very good. It's always nice to have that little reminder to move, especially with sitting down in an office chair for so long. Mm -hmm. And Christina, you were mentioning adding, you know, small movements to your day or walking farther from the car to the store. And that reminded me, I recently moved into an apartment building. Thankfully, I'm only on the sixth floor, but something that I've added to my day, if I want to go downstairs to check the mail or go outside, I take the stairs. Um, well, A, because my elevator takes forever to get here, <laughs> but also just to get moving a little more. And I, it's really nice to do that. Um, and then you also mentioned the obstacle course. I'm a very big fan of obstacle courses, although as I've gotten older, I'm a little bit too big <laughs> for some of those. So I wanted to mention a game that my partner and I play called Hide the Lemon. Um, we don't have a, a real lemon, but that's just uh, where we heard the game from, where we take an object and we hide it around our home and we spend a good half an hour hiding it and trying to find it and moving around and I that talking about an obstacle course reminded me of that as well but so we are into our uh, Q&A portion now of the presentation so if anyone in our audience has questions they'd like to ask of Danielle and Christina put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen now we have about 10 minutes for that portion uh, but I would like to start with a question uh, from myself for both of you. Uh, for educators or even parents with kiddos in our audience who are doing school online, what's a good way to incorporate more movement and more activity into their day throughout online classes? I'm assuming kids get some breaks throughout the day. Um, so how can teachers or even parents who are at home with kiddos incorporate more activity into school days like that? Yeah, I think it's a really important question because I definitely was um, thinking about the same thing when I started to prepare some remote sessions. I didn't want my kiddo sitting for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, not getting up. So I think an easy way how to prepare a kiddo to do it and to include it is just having, for example, like a visual schedule on the PowerPoint, if that's what you're using as the educator um, or the parent. And you can place, um, you know, the different items that are going to take place. So it could be first we're going to sing Oh Canada, then we're going to get up and do some dancing, and then we're going to go back to attendance, and then we're going to get up and do some yoga. So just incorporating it into the schedule, finding YouTube links, screen sharing, getting up as well as the educator or the parent, and you know, modeling the dancing and the behaviors. I feel like also encourages the students and the kiddos to uh, join in with you. But yeah, I've had a lot of success. I'd say in the last year of incorporating it, even for kiddos who at first don't want to do it at all, and then you can tell it's like their favorite part towards the end. But yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And we have a question here from a person in our audience. Uh, right now, the weather is so nice. Everyone wants to get outside to move around. But do you have any additional tips for physical activity during the winter? I know I, I personally struggled with this this winter, not having equipment at home and being in lockdown. And um, I definitely made use of the free apps and free videos. There's a great one on YouTube, uh, Fit Blender, I think it's called, or Fitness Blender. When I think of um, little children, the yoga videos Danielle shared. And there's also a site, um, I'll see if I can pull it up quickly and share it. Uh, the company is called Flag House and they make and sell fitness equipment and they have a great YouTube channel. I think it's called Flag House Sensory that includes, they have their equipment, but they mention at home versions and how to use things around the house. Um, but overall, I, I found this winter, I had to really just embrace the cold. You know, we really needed to get out. So I bundled up and um, dealt with it. So I think it, as much as you wanna make use of what you have around the house, I, I think it is worth, um, you know, uh, embracing the cold and bundling up. And if that means, you know, all you can do is get five minutes of a quick walk, that's five minutes that you got in and more of a, you know, distance than you probably could achieve in your own home. Um, and, but as um, Victoria mentioned, I think the stairs is a big one. If you, I'm in an apartment building as well, and I definitely took the stairs any chance I could to get in some, some more movement. Do you have anything to add, Danielle? 
for winter. I was also thinking, yeah, for kiddos, you could do something like, so going outside and maybe going like a scavenger hunt or playing like an mm-hmm. I spy game. So including like games to make it more motivating um, for kiddos. And even if, if it's just you as an adult, making it more fun with whoever you're walking with or yourself, like let's count how many snowmen we see or people tobogganing or, or something like that. That's kind of like winter related for kiddos. You can like print out little, you know, bingos of like what you see I spies anything mm-hmm. like that um, but it definitely is hard I 100% agree but I, th- I agree with Christina the last winter we just experienced I just made myself go outside because we were always at home so just bundling bundling up and going out listening to some music if that's motivating like a podcast anything like that to make it more enjoyable is helpful too yeah and Christina you mentioned that even if you get outside in the winter for just five minutes mm-hmm. it's still five minutes but I will say Bundling up and getting all your gear on, especially if you have to get outdoor gear on a kiddo, that's an activity in itself, right? (laughs) (laughs) So there you go. More time, more active movement. Uh, And Danielle, during your part of the presentation, you shared some resources about online yoga and other videos. Um, But is there any uh, videos or websites you recommend that are good for beginners who are just starting to get into yoga because I know yoga sometimes can be very daunting with all the hard moves but there's a lot of great beginner moves as well so do you have uh, any resources or know of any YouTube channels that are good for beginners to follow along with? Yeah, definitely. So if you're thinking of kids, um, again, I think the Cosmic Kids is really great for like beginner types of options and it's very accessible. It's, it's nothing too hard, I think, to get into. Um, if you're thinking about it for yourself as an adult, um, so the Warrior Wednesdays, I tried to make them super accessible, very beginner. There's nothing crazy in there. Like there's no headstands, um, no arm balances, it's very like simple poses that are really great foundational pieces to begin with. Um, and then additionally, I really like uh, Yoga with Adrienne is her name on YouTube. She's free um, and she's really wonderful. She has a cute little dog that comes into the practice with her and she has a lot of beginner videos. I think they're like 10, 20 minutes, but she's also a really great free resource. Awesome. I've actually done Cosmic Kids before with my nephew, who's about three years old. And I think I enjoyed it more than he did because he <laughs> like he loved looking at the background and little animations. But it's, it's mm-hmm. really nice to follow along with. I, I quite liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. And you both have mentioned Warrior Wednesdays with the Geneva Center for Autism. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Is that uh, a vi- like a soul video series that's just on YouTube or do you do live events where people can ask questions to you but in person um, is that a series that has stopped or is that continuing like is that on right now yeah so we this was an idea that we came up with during the pandemic just to get people moving um, you know across the clients that we serve and just the community base because it is on YouTube so We, yeah, they're just on YouTube. We never did like a live session specifically for the Warrior Wednesdays. Um, Christina and I last winter tried to host things for our staff that we work with and our colleagues. Like at lunch break, we would do like a 20 minute session. So she would leave some like planking and squatting and like fun stuff like that. And I would end with some stretching. So that's something we did like internally as a company, which was, which was really fun. Um, But then when places started opening up and we went back to Geneva Center, we stopped doing those things. Same with the Warrior Wednesdays. It's on a pause right now, just because we are both back in center. So typically I'm getting my exercise by running around with kiddos all day is what's (laughs) happening now, but but yeah. Awesome. So doesn't seem like we have too many more questions going on right now. So we are going to begin to wrap up. Uh, But if anyone does have any final questions that you think of after the webinar, feel free to reach out to us and we can get those questions answered for you. So once again, thank you all in our audience for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Christina and Danielle for taking time to share their information and expertise with us. Do either of you have any final words for our audience before we wrap up this event? I would say um, uh, my overall uh, hope for everyone, if you're you know, not very active or um, you're supporting a person with autism and they're not very active, then start small and really accept and, and rejoice in those small gains. Whether it's you know the first time the person is able to catch a ball from just a, a few feet away or is walking a little further with you, you know, without uh, protesting or whining and you're not having to encourage as much, 
really, you know, rejoice in those small gains and work slowly toward your, your long-term goal. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoyed, yeah, both the yoga portions and all the really great research that Christina was also bringing forward. I think it's super important and valuable to think about more often, especially in treatment centers, about how important physical movement is. Um, and again, I hope for yourself that you try out some of those yoga poses, maybe later today or tomorrow, or the next time you're in the car. Don't forget about the vacation arms. It's a good one. <laughs> but I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. I know I'll be doing a lot of those in the car because that's when you really need it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. For everyone in our audience, keep your eyes peeled to your inboxes over the next few days as all the links shared in the chat will be sent to you in a follow-up email, as well as information on where you can check out the recording for this webinar. We invite you to subscribe to the Science Center newsletter for details about upcoming events. The link can be found in the chat or at our website, ontariosciencecenter.ca. You can learn more about past Sensory Friendly Saturday programs at the link in the chat as well, or once again at our website under Plan Your Visit Sensory Friendly Saturdays. We would love to hear what you thought of today's event and to offer your suggestions for future sensory friendly Saturdays. So please take a couple of minutes after this event to answer a short survey for us that will open up in your internet browser once Zoom closes. You can join us next time on Saturday, August 7th for another workshop. Stay safe, everyone. It's a beautiful day, so I'm gonna get moving and go for a walk later on and we will see you next month. Bye.